of what he has done. We're so thankful for the cross, for the price that was paid for us. And so we sing that this morning. God, we are thankful. We love you. We praise you. You have changed our lives. We worship you in this place. I would be home. Without your goodness, I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your. 
this morning. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we're so thankful because of what you've done upon the cross. Because your love is eternal. Your mercies are new every single day, God. God, we pray that as your mercies are new every day, we can renew our vision of who you are that we can worship you freely, we can worship you like never before. Today, God, we open our hearts so we can learn about you. We're so thankful for this place. We praise you and we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You can have a seat.
Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to New Life. I don't know if you said anything. My ears are still so clogged you may have been silent. But at any rate, good morning. Um, This morning we're going to talk about worship, specifically the power of worship. But before I get into that, I just kind of want to say later in the service, we're going to show a, a, a powerful video and background is going to be scenes from the Passion of the Christ movie. So if you have a child, you, it may be a good day for them to take part of our children's ministry. We have an excellent children's ministry here. But as we talk about the power of worship, the way that I want to begin is by asking, what is your image of worship? When I say worship, what picture comes to you? For some, maybe it's kind of Old Testament pagan worship. Maybe you came from a traditional high church kind of thing. Maybe it's this kind of worship. Maybe your imagination of worship is like the angels in heaven with harps, and you think, that's really boring. I don't want to go to heaven if that's what it is. Or maybe your idea of worship is this. You say, Brett, only when you preach is that my idea of worship. Okay. I just wonder this morning if worship isn't any of those things, it really is supposed to be more like this. Any Caps fans remember what it was like for the Caps to win the Stanley Cup? And it will happen again. We'll do it again. But what happens? I mean, there's joy. There's singing. There's praise. There's celebration with people around you. There's phones. Get out your phones, by the way. If you're going to worship, we've got to get out your phones. No, um, you can follow along, actually, in this, with the sermon if you want to do that. But there's lots of joy. What if worship is supposed to be more like that? Or what if worship is supposed to be more like this? Anybody remember Popeye? Remember Popeye would feel weak and what would he do? He'd pop that spinach jar and he'd eat that spinach and all of a sudden it would make him strong. What if, here's the thing, if your idea of worship is Barney Fife, you are missing out on what you are made for. Worship, genuine worship is more like spinach to Popeye. It's powerful. Now to understand that, we need to understand a couple of things basically. And the first one is simply that to worship literally means to ascribe worth. Sometimes people relegate this idea of worship to like the religious part of their life, where they think only religious people worship. Not true. We worship in all that we do. We worship in everything because as human beings, everything and every we give we give worth to things all the time, right? If you are a Caps fan, you give worth to the Caps. If you are a Nationals fan, whoops, you ascribe worth to the Nationals. If you're a Skins fan, you ascribe worth to the Skins. You celebrate them. You wear their clothes. You pay money to buy their tickets. If you're a Cowboys fan, you ascribe worth to criminal activity. We ascribe worth... To money, we ascribe worth to work, we ascribe worth to time, we ascribe worth to relationships, and that's a good thing. We ascribe worth to, to pleasure. Anybody going on vacation? Next week when we, when we celebrate the 4th of July, we're going to ascribe worth to freedom and to the United States. We are constantly ascribing worth. It's not just like the spiritual thing that we do. In fact, we're kind of like fish. Fish don't just kind of swim occasionally. It's not just something they do. It's everything they do. The only fish that don't swim are what kind of fish? Dead fish. The only kind of people that don't worship are dead people. Everybody, if you're alive, you are constantly ascribing worship. And it's not about things. Here's the second thing I would say. Worship has power then that changes us. Many of you know that there is a sport to which I ascribe worth. And that sport is, and all God's people said? Baseball. baseball, that's right. How do you know that I ascribe worth to baseball? Because I follow baseball, I read about baseball, I enjoy baseball, I uh, talk baseball, I think baseball, I illustrate in baseball, I teach my kids to love baseball, I've taught other people's kids to love baseball. I spend time, I just baseball, 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 right? And here's the, so it changes me. In fact, I spend money on baseball. I buy baseball pants and baseball shorts and baseball t-shirts and baseball shirts and baseball jackets and baseball hats, lots of baseball hats. I ascribe worth to baseball. Not only does it change me and affect the way that I live, it also changes you. Last year, a number of you got together and very generously took up a collection so my family could go 
to Nationals games because we ascribe worth to baseball. We enjoy watching the Nationals. And you all very generously pulled money together. And we went to games last year. And we're going to games this year with that money. And I just, I feel guilty sometimes because I don't know who all contributed to this. And so I just feel like I need to say Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are really so much enjoying that. Whoever gave that to us, because we would not have gone to these games except for your generosity. And so thank you for you. But here's the point. We ascribe worth to baseball in the Andrews family. Is that wrong? Why are you hesitating? Is that wrong? No, absolutely not. Forbid it, Lord. No, it's a good thing. Okay. Um, I also ascribe worth to a certain food. Some of you know that too, right? To the... Drunken ribeye at Sweetwater. And so from time to time, I go to my worship temple at Sweetwater and I offer my offering so I can enjoy, I ascribe worth to this ribeye. Is that wrong? Maybe sometimes. Um, but I don't do it very often, a couple of times a year. But anyway, so everything that we do is worship and, every, and worship changes who we are. It even changes people around us. And it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying it is a thing. And that is why it is so important for us to understand what it means to ascribe appropriate worth to God, to worship God, because as we worship, it changes us. That's why um, uh, Richard Foster one time said, to stand before the Holy One of eternity is to change. Is that good? To worship God is to experience the power of worship, it'll change you. Now the Bible teaches this in Romans chapter one, beginning with verse 18, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what may be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. Here's the deal. It begins by saying God's wrath is being revealed. And it's not because God is peevish and an angry, you know, old man. It's because God loves. And just like a parent's wrath is kindled when their child is threatened, so God's wrath is kindled when he sees our relationships with him, our relationships with each other, our quality of life threatens. And what's threatening it, there's the truth about God that can be known, but that truth is being suppressed. Now, I want you to notice, just as a side point, it's not that the truth of God is unknowable. That's, we live in a time where, like, some liberal theological elites would say, oh, God is so great, and we are so small. God is so great, and we are so imperfect. We can't know God. And so it's just kind of it, it really folly for us to try. But the logical problem with that is it's, it, it, it's, it's based on the assumption that you can only know somebody sufficiently if you know somebody perfectly. Is there a single person you know perfectly in your life? Do you even know yourself personal, per, perfectly? You don't need to know somebody perfectly. You don't have a friend that you know perfectly, but you can still know them intimately. You can still know them closely because you can know them sufficiently. So the Bible says that God has been revealing himself to us so that we can know him sufficiently, even though we can't ever know him comprehensively. But something is keeping us from that knowledge. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, you may want to underline this, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what has been made as a result people are without excuse in other words God is his first revelation of himself to us his nature his power his goodness his faithfulness is through uh, is communicated and then by his power what good things he's done for us the, the things that we should thank him for you see um, as a result, for although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God or show gratitude, glorify him for his character, show gratitude for the good things that he's given. Instead, their thinking became worthless. Their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, so their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And again, you may want to underline these two words. And worshiped and served what had been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. 
Now, how does worship change us? Why is the wrath of God being revealed? If we can go back to the iPad, it kind of works like this. It becomes a question of what's ultimate. You see, God is the creator of the world. As the creator, his nature is perfect and worthy of praise. His, he's given us gifts worthy of thanks, okay? But if we don't thank him, if we don't praise him, see, all of these things are from him, and we say thanks for him, and we worship him because they remind us of his greatness, of his love, of his grace, of his power, but if we don't honor God and praise him as ultimate, we, what tends to happen is, if I can put this circle here, it should be that God is ultimate and all of these things, all the particulars are in their place, but instead you remove God as ultimate and all you have left oops, are created things as ultimate. And so now your created things become, we try to make ultimate things out of created things. We try to build our lives on God's gifts. We try to build our lives on money, power, work, pleasure, sports. And so created things begin to take an inordinate position in our lives. We begin to trust them more than we should and it destroys our lives. It harms our life. it robs us of life. This is why Jesus told the story one time of the, of the wise man and the foolish man. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. He said the wise man is the one who hears the words of Jesus, recognizes Jesus' truth, Jesus' authority, and obeys, puts them into action, recognizes that God is God, God is sovereign, Jesus is Lord, and therefore we are stewards of the life that he has given us, and we honor him with all of our lives, all of our lives are offerings of worship to him, and we treat everything in the context of being gifts from him. The foolish man is the one who builds his house on sand. He doesn't listen to Jesus. He doesn't follow Jesus. He doesn't treat Jesus as Lord of all. And so he builds his lives on created things. And so he says, well, I know what I'll build my life on. I'll build my life on achieving. That'll make me feel good. I'll build my life on experiencing pleasure, enjoying life. I'll build my life on more education. And what happens is storms come and reveal that those things that they've put so much weight on crumble underneath the weight of the realities of the storms of life. And that foolish man's house crashes. And that's why the wrath of God is being revealed. That's why God's wrath is kindled because he wants everybody to build their houses on rock, solid, and not on sand. Everybody worships in everything that we do. We are constantly attributing worth to things. The only question is, do we attribute worth to God as ultimate and everything else in its appropriate um, place, or do we, allow, do, we, do we take God out of the equation and say, you know what, it's my life. Maybe we live as practical atheists. We don't say that God isn't God. We just say, it's my life, it's my career, it's my money, it's my stuff, it's my future, it's my, and if God is helpful for me, I'll use him. But if not, ultimately it's me, and we build our lives on sand. What's ultimate for your life? There's power in worship, appropriate worship, to change you. Now, in the time that we have left this morning, I want to talk about some specifics of how worship of God, genuine worship of God, has power to change us. We could go on all day like this. I'm just going to be able to share with you three examples. The one example would be the power of God in worship changes us to give us joy in times that would rob us of joy. Did you see the study that was revealed last week from NPR and IBM that revealed that a whopping 84% of Americans say our generation is angrier than previous generations? 42% surveyed said that they are angrier this year than they were last year. Why are we increasingly angry? Could I suggest it is because when you put your trust, when you put your faith in created things, what happens is those things then sometime at some point get threatened. This thing just broke. 
At any rate, they, they, get, they get threatened. And what happens when they get threatened? You, you have to either fight or flee. And what has happened in our generation, there are a lot of people that have put their faith in politics, in power. And I've had people tell me, they're angrier today than they used to be, and it's because of how things are politically, and they won't be so angry once political things get straightened up. And I, you see what they've done? They've allowed created things to rob their joy. They're worshiping created things, putting too much credit in them anyway. The Bible talks about how David one time was frustrated, disappointed with God. And, um, and it says in, 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 in Psalm 43, David says, my soul, why are you so dejected? Why are you in so much turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my savior and my God. David says, I was feeling down because I was kind of allowing, allowing things to get out of, dis, out of perspective, distorted in life. And then I worshiped God and I thought, why, why am I letting this stuff get to me? God, my confidence is in you, not in the stuff that I see, not in the particulars. Psalm 73, David's frustrated because life is unfair. He sees good people are suffering while bad people seem to be having a great time. He sees uh, good people are, uh, are losing while bad people seem to be gaining the advantage. And he gets so upset. Verse two, he says, as for me, my feet had almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And for about 15 verses, David just rips God a new one for how unfair this world is. And everything turns in verse 16 where he says, when I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary and then I understood their destiny. David said, my, my joy was robbed until I went back and started to worship God and I realized, God, you are Lord of all. And my hope is not in circumstances that I see around me. My hope is not in temporary victories. My hope is in you. My confidence is that in you I will win and that you reward those who are faithful. And he gave him perspective. See, there are two meanings for worship that it's helpful to understand at this point. The one is a general meaning, the other is a specific focused meaning. In general meaning, we say everything that we do is worship. And everybody worships all the time. You are made to worship, it's who you are. You can't help but worship. But then we say, I'm going to worship, right on Sunday morning. Is that somehow wrong? Well, no, actually, the first place that the word worship is used in the Bible is Genesis 22, when um, Abraham is about to take Isaac up for a sacrifice, and he says to his servant, we will go up on Mount Moriah to worship, and we will come back to you. What's he mean? He means we're going to have a focused time of worship. We're going to give a specific offering to God in worship. And see how the two work together? When we have specific, focused times of worship on God, then when we live life every day, we worship God by everything that we do, by ascribing worth to everything in an appropriate way. And rather than things becoming little idols for us, we see things are gifts from God to be enjoyed, to be good stewards of, and to be reasons for us to praise him. See what I'm saying? So, but we need the specific worship time of God so that in general, every day, we can worship God appropriately and we don't start worshiping stuff that is made instead. Um, that's why when I was a kid, I, we used to sing a song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When we worship God and we say thanks to him, it's, it's a, just amazing how it puts everything else in life in perspective. Now this morning, we don't want to just talk about worship. We actually want to do some things that can encourage you to worship 
on your own and even here on Sunday morning. So Brennan's gonna come out right now and share with us, kind of teach us a really simple song. Actually, Mike Wilson, a guy who's just a regular guy here at New Life, said, hey, to me a couple weeks ago, hey, can I tell you how I worship God and it brings me joy? And he shared with us this, just this little, and I don't know that Mike can even carry a tune, but he just kind of repeats these, sings these phrases, and then, and then thanks God for things, or praises God for things, and it, and it brings him, he says, I was doing, I do it as I'm walking through the, 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 the grocery market, you know, someday I'm doing my shop, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yeah, and people probably think you're crazy too, but it brings him joy, and so Brendan's going to lead us in this, in this little time of, of worship as maybe a practical thing that you can do to worship God every day, so Brendan, take her over. So, can everybody just stand with me? Real quick, and it is really simple. I'm gonna sing it a couple times, and then you're gonna sing. <coughs> you are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. All right, you think you got it? That's really simple, right? I told you. Uh, all right, let's sing it a couple more times together. You are good, you are good, and you, that's it, sing it. You are good, in your love endures. So let's take some time right now. You can bow your heads, you can close your eyes, but to be really practical and so that we can take this with us um, after we leave this place. Let's just take some time just thanking God for the things that he has given us tangibly in this life, whether that's our health, our family, our jobs, um, you fill in the blank. But here, here's the thing. We want to say these things out loud and we want to be obvious with them. I'm not telling, saying you got to like scream. Even if you're whispering right now, I'm just going to keep playing. And let's just take a moment now, all of us, and let's bow our heads. You can close your eyes and just be whispering and, and thanking God for what he's given us. Sing this line again. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good. In your love endures. Now let's just take a time, some time right now. We praise God and we worship him for what he's done for each and every one of us through his son Jesus on the cross. So just take a few seconds and just give him praise in your heart, in your minds. You can continue to speak out loud and whisper those praises to him as well. But let's take a few seconds and do that together. God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, that through him we have hope, that we have life. As your word says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, Father, when we call on you, on your son, as our Lord and our Savior, God, we, we know that we are called your sons and your daughters. You've adopted us as your own, and you've given us hope that we would spend eternity with you. So, Father, we want to live our lives as lives of worship, Father, sharing your love and your truth and your joy with those around us, no matter where we are, if we're sitting in Northern Virginia traffic, God, may we just remember to sing this line together. You are good and your love endures. Let's just sing this a couple more times together. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, 
In your loving doors, you are good, you are good. In your loving doors. Amen. I hope that helps you in this next week. There's power in praise to change our perspective, to help us to see who God is and to help us to see life as it, as it actually is and to, and, and, and to give us joy. The, there's also power in worship to keep us humble, to give us appropriate perspective on who we are. Now, that makes sense, but uh, it's like Psalm 40, 20, 24, why I love so much. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Kind of hard to be arrogant when you see the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and I'm just one of those things. Psalm 29, verse 2, says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. There's glory, do God's name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 8 is classic. I like to imagine David as the shepherd boy, maybe looking out into the night sky, and he looks to the depths of the skies, and he says, I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place. What's a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You ever do that? You know, one of the great ways to worship is just to go out at night or to maybe the middle of the day. I did this past week and I was looking up to the sky beyond the clouds and I thought, God, you are so great. And he was about to show up there, I thought, just for a second. Um, God, you are so great. You are beyond the skies. You are beyond anything, I mean, the, 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 the farthest place that man will ever reach. And your love is deeper than the skies. And God, your grace is farther than east is from west. They never meet. God, you are so great. Now, one of the mistakes that Christians make sometimes is they'll see the greatness of God and then they'll look at themselves and they say, yeah, we've sinned and therefore we're worms, we're nothing. And that's not what happens. That's not humility. What happens is you look at God's greatness and then you realize, and who am I that you care for me? Yes, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but the Bible never teaches us that we are, that we are not valuable, of great value to God. It's an amazing thing. That God, you are so great. The God who's beyond, who you snapped your fingers and time began. And one day you will clap and time ends. You're beyond space and time and yet you care for me. Kind of puts everything in perspective. It's why it's important when we worship to confess our sins. Because again, it reminds us of our humble state. What happens if we don't do that is that pride inevitably creeps in. And all of a sudden, created things take a distorted view in our lives. And all of a sudden, no longer am I humbled because God has given me my abilities. All of a sudden, I'm proud because I compare myself to other people. Or I feel insecure because I compare myself to other people. Or I'm proud because of what I've achieved. Or I'm proud because of my kids. Or I'm proud because of my uh, position, or I'm proud because of my faith, or I'm proud because of my power. And all of a sudden, if we don't see God as He is and who we are appropriately, we get out, we get distorted, we get proud, and we become little gods in ourselves. We see ourselves. Can I give you a, 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 a classic example of this? Modern science. Oppenheimer, who is not a Christian, part of the um, part of the Manhattan Project, as well as many others have said that modern science grew out of a Christian biblical view of the world. That the Greeks never could have developed it because they, did not, they believed in a capricious God. But modern science grows out of the belief, where you're talking about Copernicus or Galileo or Bacon or Kepler or Newton or, or Faraday, they had this belief that God is the creator of the world and God is a rational God and therefore the creation could be understood rationally because God is communicating himself through creation. And therefore, we explore creation to not only understand who God is and how he's communicating himself to us, but also to understand how we can be better stewards of this creation that he has given us. And so as long as God is over science and God is over nature, and it's about pursuing him and honoring him and being good stewards of what he's given us, 
then, then, then not only can modern science develop, but it doesn't become God or make us gods. But what happened when God gets eliminated from that picture? Then suddenly nature and science takes an inordinate position. All of a sudden the pursuit of science becomes modern man's essentially modern man's Tower of Babel, where we are gonna show everybody else our greatness, where we're gonna prove to ourselves that we are God. And no longer are we, are we servants pursuing God, now modern science becomes about us controlling things. And as a result, as technologies advance, ethics crawl, and things begin to develop like eugenics or abortion on demand, or science starts to get used basically for sociological manipulation. Um, many have speculated that modern science would not have developed if it were, if the pre- presuppositions of so many today would have existed back in the you know, 13th, 14th centuries. Uh, G.K. Chesterton one time said, when we cease to worship God, we don't worship nothing, we worship anything. And whenever there's an area of our lives where we cease to put God as sovereign over all, it's not that we don't quit worshiping, we just will worship created things. And that really, in the end, robs us. It's why it's really important for us to understand what we're doing when we come together in worship so that our worship on Sunday morning sees God, puts God in his rightful place and puts us in our rightful places as well. I love the illustration a friend of mine came up with. I've used it before. Some of you will be familiar with this. He said, worship is kind of like, imagine that this fa- you were invited to a family's birthday party for the elder statesman of the family, the elder um, patriarch of the family. And so there, man's 85 years old, grandpa, and they're giving him gifts and they're s- singing songs and they're telling stories, family stories, and there's laughter and there's joy, and it's just a great time. And as a ge- guest of that family, there's a part of you that kind of sits there and says, you know, this family has something I'd like to be a part of. That's really cool. But what would you think later on in talking to your friend about the party if your friend said to you, you know, yeah, that was a good party, but sometimes I don't like going to these family birthday parties for other people because sometimes I don't get gifts. You know, and sometimes, I, like, I don't get a whole lot out of it, and I don't find them really very enjoyable, and, but sometimes I do, so I'm glad that one worked out for you. What would you say about that? You say, you don't go to somebody's birthday party, somebody's celebration for you and what you get out of it. That's really kind of self-centered. You go to honor the patriarch. You go to give gifts to to honor somebody else. But part of the reason why worship can be weak in in, in America is so many Americans have this idea that what we do on worship is for us. We come to worship on Sunday morning and it's about me. It's about what I get out of it. It's about my being lifted up. No, but what happens is when we come and we worship God and we offer him praise and we offer him our sacrifices and we listen to his stories, he picks us up. But the purpose is not for me to be lifted up. The purpose is for God to be lifted up, for me to focus on him. The byproduct is that I get blessed. Now what would you think if you were having this conversation with your friend and your friend told you, you know, the real reason we had that whole party, the reason we gave the gifts and sang the songs and told the stories, the real reason was we wanted you to feel like you wanted to be part of our family. What would you say about that? You'd say, that's weird. You'd say, that's actually kind of manipulative. But again, that's the approach that some churches have taken recently. It's like the purpose of Sunday morning worship is to attract people who don't yet belong to the family. No, the purpose of Sunday morning worship is for us to offer our worship and praise and offerings to God, to hear his stories, for him to be honored. And in the process, we get lifted up. And if we do this authentically and we do this well, then people who aren't yet part of the family will naturally say, I was made for that. I want to be a part of that family. But the purpose is still to honor God in his place and to allow ourselves to be seen in our place, you see. 
There's, everybody worships all the time. There's great power in worship to change us. What you worship, how you worship, will determine who you become. Worship is spiritual spinach for us from God. The final thing that I would say, observe, is that worship makes us confident. Psalm 46 verse one says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. Um, how do we have confidence in life? And what does it have to do with God and created things? Um, so the way that we are intended, the way that God would have us live life is that we see that everything is made by him for us. And so we thank him for it and we praise him for his character. And when we do that, everything is in its right context. But if we don't do that, what we start to do is we start to put our trust in particular things. We start to elevate particular things. And where it really gets tested is with the ultimate questions of life. Everybody has to answer the ultimate questions in life. Now, most people candidly don't think about these questions very deeply. What happens when people don't think about them though is they get nagged by them because they're not answered sufficiently. They go through life and every once, something will happen, they'll say, you know, something just doesn't feel right. There's something missing in my life. Something's not working in my life. I feel kind of empty in my life. And the, that is the result of the lack of confidence that comes when your ultimate questions are not answered sufficiently or consistently, internally consistently. And the ultimate questions are origin, identity, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where did I come from? Identity, who am I? Meaning, what gives life meaning? What gives suffering meaning? Morality, what's good and not good? What's truth? What's loving and what's not loving? And destiny, what gives me hope? What gives hope in every situation? What gives hope for life beyond this life? And if you put your hope in created things, what happens is you start to try to answer these questions with created things. So there are a lot of people that try to get their identity in their work. They try to find meaning in their work. But what happens? They lose their job. They go through a midlife crisis. They retire. And all of a sudden, their identity is shaken. All of a sudden, what gives meaning to my life? There's some people that try to find meaning in their relationships. How many marriages fall apart because people try to find ultimate identity and ultimate meaning in their relationships, in their marriage? And then all of a sudden they find the marriage isn't so rewarding anymore. This, I'm not finding so much joy, so much meaning in this marriage anymore. What do they say? I must have married the wrong person. No, you are treating, you are putting an ungodly weight on your marriage to do for you what only the God of eternity can do for you. And you'll destroy that relationship because that relationship was not meant to carry you and to give you a sense of meaning and identity. You know what a lot of people do today? A lot of people in our generation will say, well, it happens in every generation, actually. They'll say, you know what? It begins with morality. They'll say, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. It's my truth. And if I can agree with God and I agree with the Bible, then I'll take that truth. But if I don't agree with it, what, nobody's gonna tell me what to do. And what happens is, if there is no ultimate truth, no ultimate measure of right and wrong beyond you, then what gives your life meaning? In fact, this is why philosophically, in the last century or so, we have come to a place where philosophers would say, we are living in the age of philosophical despair. Why? Because they've come to the conclusion there is no ultimate truth, there is no right and wrong. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Nietzsche or uh, Heidegger or Camus or Sartre, whatever. They, uh, they say there is no ultimate good or bad in life. They, you know, some of them, you know, uh, um, Huxley just didn't want anybody uh, uh, you know, challenging his sexuality. But then if there's no right or wrong, there is no ultimate meaning in life. But they say, nobody can live as though there is no meaning in life and no ultimate hope in life. And so we have to act like there is meaning in life and hope in life. And so there, we've come to this place of, of philo philosophical absurdity. Okay, we don't want there to be any morality except my morality, but that means there's no meaning, there's no hope, but nobody can live like that, so we're gonna live as though there is, which is absurd. 
And that's what happens if you try to make particular things ultimate things. But if God is God, if Jesus Christ is Lord of all, if God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and everything in life is for him and from him, and you can enjoy all of those good things that he's given them to you to, to enjoy, like baseball and relationships, but you do it in proper aspiring uh, or uh, uh, ascribing of worth, then what happens? God is the one who answers the question of origin. What's your origin? It is not impersonal. It is not accidental. It is a personal, loving God. What is your identity? Your identity is not in things that are passing away, your body, your work, your accomplishments, your money, your stuff. Your identity is in the fact that you are made by God, made in his image. Your identity is in Jesus Christ, that he died for you on the cross, and that can't be taken away, no matter what happens in your life. No matter whether you are known by everybody or known by nobody, whether you have any, nobody or lots of money, your identity is secure. It's in whether your relationships are rewarding and people love you or you like you feel nobody loves you. Your identity, nobody can take away your identity in Christ, loved by God. What gives your life meaning? God has made you for purpose. What gives your life meaning? Jesus says, the, the Bible's given to us to help us understand. Love God, love people. The most important thing in life is loving God and loving people. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Your life has meaning. You know, so many people today are thinking, I want my life to have a legacy. I want people to remember me be, but when I'm gone. People may not remember. There are lots of good people that nobody remembers when they're gone. You know what matters? What gives life meaning? That your life matters to God. That he's given you purpose and you're living for him. And nobody may ever appreciate that except the God of eternity. And that's who matters. And then where's your morality come from? God has revealed his truth, his morality, his love to us in the Bible. And where's confidence in our destiny? That Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And therefore, there is no hopeless situation now because Jesus Christ conquered our greatest enemy. And therefore, there's no situation that I face right now that I know he can't conquer. There's no situation that's hopeless now. I have my hope in him. And the question then becomes, where's your confidence? Is your confidence in created things or is your confidence in the creator? Confident people see God as their creator in all that they do. Now there's one thing that I struggle with a lot where I need confidence in God and that's where I fear. What makes you afraid? If I could ask, could you kind of just make a list of the things that you're afraid of right now, kind of a mental list? One of the things that worship does for me is that God uses it to restore my confidence in him, puts things in perspective. Now, I'm gonna share with you a song right now that I have used, that God has used to help me worship him. It's called David's Psalm. And listen to the words because they come from the Old Testament. They're psalms songs of assurance, words of assurance. Now, some of you may say, man, that is old style music. And some of you are gonna say, that's really cool. I like this music. But some of you are gonna say, oh, that's kind of nerdy. Well, welcome to Brett. But, <laughs> but I would ask you to listen to the words of this song. Whenever I listen to this, it's like God pulls out of me the things that I'm afraid of. I'm not even aware of these things that I'm afraid of. People, confrontations, deadlines, financial pressures, whatever they are. And God restores my soul. Let's listen to this together. And would you just offer your fears to him and let him give you confidence? Let's listen together, please. The reason I share that is because we want to give you some tools today to be able to worship on your own and to reconnect with God in a way that puts things in perspective. And uh, I have a hard time talking sometimes when I pray. Sometimes I like, don't know what to pray or my mind wanders. But if I can find the right worship music... I can just kind of sit there and pray those words and there's power in the music and the Holy Spirit shows up and it just makes, you know, okay, all of these things that I'm anxious about, all of these things that I've allowed, to, if the Lord is with me, what should I fear? There's power in worship to change us, to give us joy, to keep us humble, to give us confidence 
confidence in a world that provokes our anxieties and fears. I pray today that it's been a helpful time to now encourage you to go from this place and, and to worship on your own and to come here and to be prepared to worship genuinely as well. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we turn our eyes to you. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We worship you as God alone and we cast down before you all of the idols, all of the things, all the crowns that we would hold on to to say you're Lord and you're good. Through Christ we pray, amen. Now there's no more powerful way for us to worship God than through communion or the Lord's Supper. We do that every week here, we share that. And today we're gonna do something really powerful. It's, it's powerful because Jesus gave it to us. The night before he was crucified, they were taking Passover and he took the bread and he said, this is my body given to you, for you. Eat and remember me. He took the cup, the wine, and said, drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. This is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time when we come together and we genuinely worship God at communion and we see what Jesus did for us on the cross, it brings us joy because it reminds us how much he loves us and it makes us humble because it reminds us how sinful we've been and the price that was needed to pay for our sins, but it gives us confidence because it reminds us our confidence is not in our sufficiency, but in his. We're gonna do something special with this communion today, and that is we're gonna play what I, is my favorite hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And to the background, we've, we've placed images from the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And I think for many of, this, for any of you who find this very meaningful and moving, now, if you have a child here, you may not want your child to be here. If you uh, are hurt by violence, don't want to see violence, that's okay. Close your eyes and listen to the words and worship God. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, could you listen to these words and watch what Jesus Christ did for you? And I would just ask, the, whenever I think about Christ's sacrifice for me on the cross, I just think, how can anybody say no to this man? And if you're ready to live with the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God is God, and everything else is a gift from him, then you can surrender to Jesus Christ today and be made right with God. You can be baptized today. There are people in the back who would love to talk with you and pray with you, and you can start that life new today. Let's worship God together in this time of communion, please. Let's share communion. cross on which the prince of glory died my riches gave I count my loss and overcome
Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. That through him we have been healed. Father, we just continue to worship you now. for Jesus. We thank you that as we see in that verse in Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. God, thank you. We just worship you and we want to continue to worship you today. 
Father, we love you and we pray all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Is God good? Yes, go ahead and applaud and applaud. Woo! He loves us so much. And it's not a fantasy, it's real. Um, you know, one thing we've not done real well today, it occurs to me, is like celebrate and like enjoy each other. So we're going to take an offering right now, and that's, that's great. But make sure you say something to your, the person beside you today. Just kind of say, so glad to see you. Hey, my name is great, whatever. Okay. Um, we're going to take an offering right now, which is another way that we worship God. Because God is the, Jesus is the Lord of all. It means he's the Lord of our time. He's the Lord of our gifts. Everything good is from him. And we give back to him the first of what he's given to us as an expression of faith, because we also want to advance his kingdom in this world. And, 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 um, and we honor him with, with, in faith by putting him first. And so that's what the offering is about. May you give this offering as an offering of worship to God. It's about him. Um, and uh, what would it look like if you worshiped God in your finances the way that he deserves? Just throw that out there for you. If you're new here and not ready to give, it's between you and God. We're glad that you're really here. Um, we're really glad that you're here too. Okay, so let's go into, uh, and take up an offering. And as we do... Brendan Loveless has oh, a couple hey, announcements to share. I'm back. <laughs> By the way, I'm still kind of under the weather. I, it's like, you, you ever get ear infections and it's like you're listening with cotton balls in your ears or whatever? It's kind of like, okay, so that's what's going on. I'm not going to shake hands today is all I'm saying. So, so I'm not being rude. Still love y'all, but I'm not going to. Don't pass. touch this guy. No, okay? Touch me. Don't touch Don't, him. <laughs> all right. Not that, uh, you ever, not that you ever wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You know what? Uh, God is so good, isn't yep. he? I, that song, that's one of my favorite songs, How Deep the Father's Love, that we just sang. Um, I, I almost started crying in the middle of that just after watching that video. Um, God's just moving in such a powerful way here at New Life. And we're so glad that you're here and that you're worshiping with us. There's a lot of stuff going on. So two things I just want to share really quick. One, there's a lot of amazing opportunities to get connected. If you're new here uh, or maybe you want to take a next step, maybe you want to talk to somebody, ask questions about baptism, or what it looks like to follow Christ, um, would you go to newlife.church slash info? There's a lot uh, of stuff. If you grabbed one of the programs uh, that the greeters were, were giving you, handing out today, you can grab one on your way out, by the way, but um, there's a lot of information, a lot more information than, than what's on those pieces of paper at newlife.church slash info. We're trying to push everybody there um, because that's where you're going to get answers to things and figure out what's going on at New Life and the End Zone. So check that out. The other thing is... Um if you want to, if you're new here and you want to find out who we are as a church, we do something called Take Five in the back. I'll be back there. I would love to meet you. I would love to say hi. Unlike Brett, I am not sick, so you can shake my hand, uh, and but stay away from him. But I'd love to meet you back there. Dale Spaulding, uh, he's back there as well. We would love to, to just chat with you for a few minutes, give you a five-minute overview of who we are as a church. That's all I've got. Let's stand and... Um, Let's, let's pray. I'll be praying for all of you this week. Um, just that some of these things that we did today, that they would become just habitual in your life um, and, and also in mine as well. I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you um, for the cross. Thank you that we could come here, that we could worship you. God, would you let us take these tools, uh, some of these uh, things that Brett shared today and that we did together, and, and may they just become a part of our lives and our hearts. Um, Father, when we're sitting in traffic, you are good and your love endures and just giving you gratitude for everything that you've given us, including your son. Father, we love you. Um, we love Jesus. And we just pray all of these things in his name. Amen. See you next week. God bless.